Hey everybody, welcome. We are on an introduction to economics. This is video three and this one is focused on opportunity cost. And let me just say from the beginning guys, this is a concept I cannot overstate its importance. If you were to ask a hundred different economists what is the number one concept in all of economics or the most important, they would probably say this one, or at least a majority I would say would say this one. It is probably the number one contribution economics has made to the field of social science. It is the economist conception of what is cost. Remember guys, what is economics? It's a study of mankind and the ordinary business of life. Basically, it is a study of us as we navigate through life, as we make decision after decision after decision. And when we make those decisions, what do we do? We weigh the benefits versus the cost, and it is the economist's conception of cost that I think they've really added when it comes to the social sciences that are out there. So, let's get to it. Let's talk about Lisa. Let's say Lisa's 13 years old and she's thinking about opening up a lemonade stand on Saturday. And let's just say where, Le where Lisa lives is Billy Bob's Lemonade Rental Stand Company. And Billy Bob's will rent you everything you need to run a lemonade stand for a day for $50. And when I say everything, guys, they'll give you a canopy, they'll give you a table, chair, they'll give you a cooler with ice, with the water, with the concentrate, all the things you need, the cups, all of it with this one caveat that at the end of the day you must return everything back to them anything you didn't use plus of course the fiscal capital right the desk and the chairs and all that you must return it all at the end of the day to them and again again it's going to cost fifty dollars and let's just say that lisa has estimated and let's say that her estimates are very good she has estimated her total revenues for the day are going to be hundred and fifty dollars her total sales when she calculates her revenues at the end of the day adds them all up she's going to sell hundred fifty dollars worth of product would this endeavor be profitable remember that fifty dollars gets her everything she needs to run that stand with that said would it be profitable to I think a lot of people, they'd say, absolutely, she's going to make $150, she's going to spend $50, that's, a, that's definitely $100 of profit. The economist would not even answer the question. They would say, well, I don't have enough information. The economist can't make a decision unless they know about an alternative use of the resources. Economists always consider the next best alternative. I think that's the number one contribution of economists, again, in the entire field of social sciences, is the fact that when they are presented with something and told all kinds of benefits and perhaps even the explicit cost, and the explicit cost is the cash outlay of doing something, they still don't say, oh, wow, well, let's go do it. They always pause. They always say, Guys, I need to know the full cost, the opportunity cost, the opportunity loss. I need to know everything that is foregone when we make a decision, which includes the net benefit of the next best alternative. So, let's add a little bit to this question. Let's say that Lisa's next best alternative is she could go babysit for the Smith family. See, the, ba the Smith family, they need a ba babysitter, and let's just say for the same time, from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. for those 10 hours, on Saturday, and let's say they pay $12. Well, now, with that information, and let's say we know that's the next best alternative for Lisa, would it be profitable to open up the lemonade stand? Now, before I answer it, I want to do something here. I want to clap my hands and say Ceteris Parabis, okay? So there's a little tangent in this video. I want to talk about the concept of Ceteris Parabis because this is going to come in handy quite often as we do economics, all right? Ceteris Parabis is holding everything else constant, okay? Holding everything else equal. So before some of us might make that decision, we might say, well, hey, what does she get more joy doing? Babysitting or being outside, interacting with different people, selling le lemonade? Let's take that into account. And y'all, that is important. There's no doubt about it. That is important. But what I'm going to do a lot of times is I'm going to clap my hands and say, Ceteris Pravis, everything else held constant. Remember, meaning the amount of joy from the lemonade stand and the amount of joy babysitting being held constant. Okay, with that said, let's clap the hands, Ceteris Pravis. Is it profitable to open up the lemonade stand? The economist says no. She would incur a loss. You see, the explicit cost is $50. She'd have that be the cash outlay. But she would also, in addition to that explicit cost, there would be an implicit cost of $120. She'd be foregoing $120. Her total cost, her opportunity cost, would be $170. Her total benefit, $150. That would be the revenue. So $150 minus $170, she would have a loss of $20. Bucks. She should not open up the lemonade stand. And here's the key, guys. 
That's the thing about economists. The economists are trying to figure out what we should do. If you would have presented that same set of uh, um, um, information to an accountant and you said, would it be profitable? The accountant would say yes, because the accountant is trying to decide, can we do something? But again, the economists, they're trying to figure out the optimal decisions. They're trying to figure out, should we do something? And if something is profitable, that means it is the best thing that they can do. And if there is a loss, that means there is a next best alternative that is better. Now, here's the thing. I'm going to walk you through this diagram. I don't want us memorizing this diagram. I really want us to internalize this concept. But sometimes diagrams like this are a good stepping stone to getting some type of concept internalized. So this diagram right here will answer you any opportunity cost problem you are ever asked. Here's how it works, guys. Up here, we've got the resources you have when you're making a decision. Oftentimes, they're your time. Oftentimes, there's some money aspect to it. Sometimes there's other things, but these are the main two things we want to think about as far as our resources we have when we make a decision. And then we want to think about traveling path A. In this case with Lisa, this would have been opening up the lemonade stand. But we also want to think about the MBA, the next best alternative, which again was babysitting. So here's how it would work. Traveling path A, what would be the total benefit? Well, for Lisa, that would have been that total revenue. That would have been $150. Minus, and now what's in the brackets right here is opportunity cost. That's right. From here to here is opportunity cost. I've got my explicit cost. Again, that's what most people think about when they think about cost. The economist definitely considers the explicit cost, but also, in addition, considers the implicit cost. So, what would be the cash outlay? $50. We put $50 there. What would be the next best alternative? Heading to the Smith House to be a babysitter, right? And then what would the total benefit of that next best alternative B, that would be $120. That's how much you would make. What would be the explicit cost of the MBA? The explicit cost, the cash outlay. Well, nothing. You don't walk in and have to pay any money to babysit, right? So that is zero. So 50 plus 120 minus zero. The total cost, the opportunity cost is $170. So 150 minus 170, a loss of $20. Again, I think this diagram is helpful, it brings clarity, but we don't want to just rely on it. In time, we want to see if we can internalize it. And all we're really doing, again, is looking at explicit cost plus the implicit cost. Let's use this diagram as we go through some other decisions in life. Let's say you're thinking about buying a sofa or a mattress for your bed, okay? A sofa, a new sofa, or a master for maybe, or sorry, a mattress for let's say your king size bed. So let's get, to, let's say they're, they cost the same. Let's say the sofa is $2,000 and that new mattress is $2,000. If I asked you what's the cost of the sofa, I think you might say to me it's $2,000, right? I like to say we talk like accountants. However, I think we really think intuitively a lot of times like economists because I think the true cost, the way you're really making the decision, is you're thinking, no, 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 the cost of that sofa is really me giving up the mattress, right? That's how we're thinking about it. We're saying I got $2,000. I can either get a sofa or a mattress. I can't get both right now. I don't have enough money for both. I don't want to go into debt, okay? So I'm either going to buy one or the other, and you're really thinking the cost of the sofa is the mattress, and that's how you should think. That's how an economist would think. Don't think about it. It's not that cash. It's truly what is the next best alternative that you're giving up. Now, let's see if this diagram behind me gives me the right result. So, what would be path A? Buying the sofa. The total benefit, what we could put here is we just write sofa, or we could put the utility we would get from the sofa, right? The joy, if you will, from the sofa. Minus the explicit cost of the sofa, and let's say that was $2,000. What's the next best alternative? It's going and buying that mattress, that new mattress. Total benefit is the total utility from the mattress. So again, the mattress goes here, the sofa goes here. Really, it's the utility, the joy from the mattress, minus the explicit cost of the mattress, right? Which is $2,000. That $2,000 and that $2,000 cancel out, right? So what is the cost? That's what this is. Remember, $2,000 and $2,000 cancel out. What is the cost? cost of buying the sofa, it is the mattress.
Guys, that comes into play when we think about going out to lunch somewhere, right? If we're going out to lunch, we don't usually think so much about the cash, right? When we're making a decision, we're saying, hey, we can either go get a salad or a hamburger or a sandwich or a pizza. We're thinking about all those things that we could get at lunch, and we're finally saying, okay, hmm, where should I go? Oh, I'm going to go get the hamburger. And what we're really thinking is, man, if I can get the hamburger, I get the salad. What it's really costing me is the salad. It's not so much the cash that we're focused on. It's really that other thing that we could have had that we're foregoing. And guys, I'd like to say that is really the true cost of your decision because you're going to get something for lunch, right? And so the true cost is the next best alternative thing that you could have gotten. Now, if you still haven't got it, let's go into some other important life things, okay? You're thinking about going to college. This one's going to hit home for all of us, right? Let's say graduate or undergraduate doesn't matter. We can think graduate right now. When we think about that decision, of course we're going to think about the total benefits of going to this graduate school. But we're not just going to think about the cash outlay. Now, is that important? Certainly. We're definitely going to consider it. The economists definitely consider the explicit cost. That is important, the cash outlay. But we are also, in addition, going to consider the next best alternative, which might have been staying with our former job. And the total benefit might be the salary we are now going to forego. And there might not be any explicit cost to the next best alternative again, right? Because working doesn't have an explicit cost to it. So what's the total? So you got the total benefit, but what's the total cost? It's the explicit cost plus the foregone salary. That is how we should really consider a decision like going to graduate school. Now, let me just say, guys, I think that the total benefits are humongous, so I think you made the right decision, but that's how we should consider cost. Next, life decision. Think about having a kid or another kid or your third kid, whatever the situation. Okay, you're thinking about having a kid. Now, Certainly, should we take the explicit cost into account when we're making this decision? Now, there's certainly a total benefit, right, of having a kid, no doubt. Lots of joy, love, okay, bigger family for the rest of your life. There's a lot of benefits, but the explicit cost, should we take those into account? Absolutely. There's a lot of them, right? Food, health care, and education. Lots of explicit costs that are very important. But guys, I definitely don't think we're making decisions just based on the explicit cost. There's many people that could afford another, that can have another child, but they don't choose to because of the next best alternative. All that time, all that sleep, all that energy. And this is why you'll see a lot of times why somebody might have one kid or two kids, but they don't have a ton of kids because, hey, I'm getting into marginal analysis here. The marginal benefit might not exceed the marginal cost for some kid. But anyhow, that'll come in the next video, right? Which is going to be, again, tied to this video because it's going to be looking at marginal cost. And anytime we think of cost, we need to think about opportunity cost. Finally, public policy. Okay, finally, one last thing. So you're presented with a public policy. You're talking to a bunch of people. Perhaps somebody is telling you all the benefits that would come by having eye exams in the first three years of primary education for low-income kids. You see, a lot of kids struggle early on in school because they're not seeing the board and what the teacher is doing all that well. They think they're just not that great at school, and it really hurts their um their, their uh, confidence when it comes to education has long-term impacts. So there is a ton of benefits of doing eye exams in the first three years of school, especially for students who don't necessarily get those types of eye exams. So we can think about for uh, communities that are struggling, for low-income kids, we're going to do this for the first three years. Now, we say that to somebody and we describe all those benefits, the benefits of like having more confidence when it comes to education. That's going to be incredibly important the rest of their life. And so a lot of us hear all that and we then might be told it's only going to cost, say, $100 million. We should do it, right? Again, the economists, they pause. That's right. They say, I don't know. I don't know. What is the next best use of those funds. Tell me what we would do that with that $100 million if we did not do this. Hey, it might be a, a lot of different things, providing after school or before school programs. It could be providing technology to those families. There is all kinds of things that we might be able to do. There's some next best alternative. I'm sure you might be able to think of some right off the bat, some next best alternative. Here's the key. The economist doesn't just hear all the benefits of something and then hear the explicit cost and then say if we should or should not do. The economist always pauses, always pauses. 
and says, what is our next best alternative? What is the alternative use of these resources and what is the net benefit of that next best alternative? And they always take that into account when they are making a decision. You cannot make a decision without information about an alternative. That is the key. Hope that made sense to you. We'll see you in the next video.